Who's reading? Who's reading? Okay, good evening. My name is Sherry Williams and I'll be your moderator for this class. Welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school and not a church and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization. Cynthia's moderating. I'm sorry. Sorry, that's my fault. I, I... <laughs> I know I looked at it. I said I wasn't the moderator. <laughs> go ahead, Sherry. Just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know where I was. Um, this is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. This Tampa class was established in 1996. At this time, I would like to introduce to you the Dean of this class, Dr. Joel Turner, and our president, Dr. Cynthia Smith. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the word or son and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our heavenly father is Yahweh. It has been erroneously substituted by Lord. The true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been erroneously substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the true and original name of our father and his son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud, <clears throat> excuse me, to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions, and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit 
manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Joshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should all ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface to the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Also in this school, we have 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives, and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10th is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. You want to announce, did you? What's, who's reading, and I mean, uh, what the scripture is? I don't. Um, yeah, the scripture reading will be Genesis, the second chapter. And our readers tonight, sorry. Um, Latara and Darlene. Latara and Darlene. Yeah, I'm a reader. Okay, and so the script reading will be by Latara Burley. Genesis, the 22nd chapter. And we'll have a prayer <laughs> by a prayer by uh, Gary Williams. Okay. Good evening, class. Good evening. Let us all bow our hearts and minds. Giving thanks unto you, Yahweh, through your son, Yahshua, the Messiah, for allowing us to gather together once again that we might learn something about your divine purpose, pattern, and plan of salvation, which is your son, Yahshua, the Messiah. Father, we thank you for seeing us when we were in darkness and ignorant of your divine love and purpose, and you 
having mercy and showing mercy unto us and calling us out of that ignorance and that pain that we were in and putting us on the path to knowing you as you really is through your son, Yahshua the Messiah. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given us, Father. Through your son, Yahshua the Messiah, let us all say hallelujah. 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 All right, good evening. I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testament, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trainer of the Scripture Research Association. Genesis, the second chapter. 26, I think. Oh, 26? Was it 26, Joel, or two? 22, please. 22. 22. Okay, sorry. Genesis, the 22nd chapter. And it came to pass after these things that Elohim did prove Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for a burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which Elohim had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, Elohim will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together and they came to the place which Elohim had told of him. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of Yahweh called unto him out of the heavens and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest Elohim, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and look and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son and Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh Jireh and as it is called to this day Yahweh will provide and the angel of Yahweh called unto Abraham out of the heavens the second time and said by myself have I sworn said Yahweh for because thou hast done this thing and thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of the enemies, of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose up, and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Malchai, the, thou hast, she has also bore children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz the firstborn, and Buzz his brother, and Kemuel the father of Aram, and Chels and Hazar, Hazar and Pedash and Jilab and Bethuel and Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Malchi did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was 
Rehuma, she bear also Teba and Gaham and Bash Hash, sorry, and Micah. That was Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Hallelujah. Okay. Sorry about the confusion, everybody. It's been a day, uh, technology uh, issues. But anyways, um, so uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to our class. Uh, it's great to have all the visitors. And I would like to ask for our first speaker, Dr. Connor Messarelli. Hello and good evening, everyone. Good, good evening. evening. That was a surprise. You caught me in the middle of brushing my teeth. <laughs> but, um, well, since I'm the first speaker, I laid down a, a foundation. So uh, I need a couple scriptures. Um, the Abrahamic promise would be the first one. And then Exodus chapter three, where Yahweh reveals the name to Moses. And then we'll, we'll go from there. Where did you want to start at? Um, in Genesis, you want to do start at 16? Um, the part the part where it says, lo and behold, a gray darkness fell upon Abraham. Does anyone know where that is at? That's not in the 22nd chapter. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for it actually right now too. It's in the 15th chapter, I believe. Um, um, the okay. 12th, there. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, Genesis 15 and 12. Let me see. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Thank you. So this is talking about Abraham's seed because Abraham didn't have his own son at first. He had someone in his house by the name of Eliezer of Damascus, which was his steward. So Abraham and Yahweh were talking and Abraham told Yahweh that you've given me no seed. So Yahweh told Abraham that he would give him his own seed. And that would be his own heir. So later, um, if we could pull up the chart, the birth of Isaac, it's on the 40 plate chart. Uh, see, I'm looking for it. It is. All right, it's um, Abraham and King Melchizedek. All right, give me so just that's... Okay, no problem. Okay, helps. So around the 40 plate chart is. Yeah, it's plate uh, 23. So. Okay, this one? Uh -huh. Yep, that's the one. So as it, as it just was in the uh, scripture reading that we read, it talks about Abraham and Isaac and how Isaac is offered up as a sacrifice. There were quite some interesting points in there. Um, two things that caught my attention when, when Abraham said unto the two men, uh, which represents the law and the prophets, the two men. 
And then he said, I and the lad will return unto you. That was very interesting. And then he also said uh, to his son, Isaac, Yahweh will provide himself a lamb. That instantly reminded me of Yahshua the Messiah and how Yahweh provided himself a lamb. And uh, it's the only sacrifice that Yahweh accepted is uh, Yahshua the Messiah. He didn't accept any of the burnt offerings, the lambs, none of that. Those are just types and shadows to point up to Yahshua the Messiah. But so now back to the Abrahamic promise. The children of Israel originally started out in Canaan's land, but there was a famine and they had to go down to Egypt to get food. Um, this was where Joseph, uh, the one with the coat of many colors, was evilly entreated by his brothers and sold down into slavery where Joseph became second in command because Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of that time had a dream and Joseph through Yahweh was the only one that was able to interpret it. So Yahweh gave him the interpretation. Joseph became it's just a type, but he became a type of Yahshua the Messiah. So after the children of Israel went down into Egypt, Joseph saved them by giving them food. And he, and he pretty much saved a lot of people up by giving them food, because if he did it, people were going to starve and they were going to die. So... That's the type of Yahshua and Messiah because he's giving us right now spiritual food, which is purging our souls. And uh, could someone get the definition of the word purge, please? But Yahshua the Messiah is purging our souls and he's saving us from Yahweh's wrath or from death. And, uh, so after the children of Israel go down into the land of Egypt, they're there for 400 years and they're evilly entreated by Pharaoh because there arose a new Pharaoh that knew not Joseph and he feared the children of Israel. Uh, if we could pick up those scriptures, please. He feared the children of Israel and, um, and just let me know when you have it. Um, I have a definition of purge. Okay. okay. It says uh, to rid something or someone of an unwanted quality, condition, or feeling. Um, let me see. Remove abruptly to get rid of, to clear out, um, to root out, eradicate, dismiss, weed out. Thank you. That was good. So as you can see, it says to root out. And uh, that's what Yahshua the Messiah is. He is rooting out all the bad things out of our souls by cleaning us with the true gospel, which is himself. He is the gospel. Okay. His, his, um, I have more. His, um, it says physically remove or expel or atone for or wipe out. Thank you. So atone for or wipe out. See, after Yahshua Messiah died, buried, resurrected, and ascended, and poured out his Holy Spirit, he, he atoned for us. He sacrificed himself through the eternal spirit um, and, and is now cleaning us up and wiping all these things out and cleaning us up and the way I, that I've been taught it is this. If you're still here, Yahshua is protecting you. If you're not dead yet, Yahshua is protecting you. And also, if you're still here, it means you still got something to learn. Because if you didn't have something that Yahshua needed to take away, you wouldn't be here. You'd be dead. You'd be dead already. You'd be back in the... You would be... 
yeah, you'd be dead. You'd be back in eternity. So, um, but I'll go back to the, the children of Israel. So the Pharaoh of that time feared the children of Israel and feared that they would become enemies to him and that they would take over his country. He didn't know Yahweh would be the one that would be destroying his country. So, and uh, could we pick up where it says, I have seen the affliction of my people? I have seen and heard the affliction of my people. And I have come down to deliver them. Exodus 3 and 10, I think. Thank you. Darlene, do you have it? Is she is she an other reader? Exodus 3 I, and 10. Come yeah. now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto Elohim, I think it's up a little further. I think, think, further. It seven. I yeah. think it is, yeah. Seven. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place. Thank you. Uh, that was good. So at this point, uh, I'll get into a little bit of back, background story about it. Moses is in the land of Midian uh, or the wilderness of Sinai because down in Egypt, he was, when he went out and confronted two, he didn't confront, he intervened for two Hebrew uh, men and any, an Egyptian. So the Egyptian was actually Pharaoh's son and the brother, brother in that was being evilly entreated was Aaron, his brother. So Moses took Aaron's rod and he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. He didn't murder him. He killed him. So the second day, Moses went out among his brethren and intervened again. And they said, who may be a prince and a judge over thee and tend us out to kill me as thou did the Egyptian yesterday? And Moses feared and knew this thing was known. So he fled out of Egypt into the wilderness of Sinai. He, when he was at Mount Sinai, Yahweh Elohim, who keep in mind, Yahshua the Messiah is in Egypt at this time. He manifested himself as a 30 year old man. Uh, and after Joseph died, it was just, and that fulfills a scripture where it says, Joseph said, after I die, Elohim will surely visit you. So Elohim or Yahshua and Messiah did visit them. And he walked there around there and witnessed everything that was happening. So when Moses was in Mount Sinai, he astral projected himself uh, to Moses as the burning bush. Because Moses, if you saw a bush that was burning, pretty sure no, none of us would think that that's a normal bush. So it's a vision. Moses is having a vision and he's speaking to the creator. And Moses receives three things, a couple things from the creator. He receives, because um, Yahweh tells Moses, I will be what I will to be. He says, Aya Asher, Aya. And he gives him his name, Yahweh. Also, go, he has three other signs, which is the one is the rod, which is the serpent. And uh, the rod represents I will be what I will to be or the truth. And then he goes down uh, with the name of Yahweh. And Aaron and Moses, Moses is a stutter. So he represents Yahweh because Yahweh just repeats himself all the time. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So Aaron represents a, a prophet because he can speak well. 
So Yahweh tells, and he's talking to both of them at the same time. This is a really neat thing that he did. At the same time, he's astral projecting to Moses and talking to him. He's talking to Aaron at the same time. And uh, that distinguishes the creator from us because if we astral projected, we would have to be sleeping first. We wouldn't be able to. We wouldn't be able to be awake physically. So Moses then goes down with the, the witnesses of blood, water, spirit, uh, the law and the prophets, the name of Yahweh, the truth. And he goes down into Egypt. Then the 10 devastating plagues are poured out upon Egypt. And to this day, Egypt is still not the same. And uh, Egypt, if you look it up, it's also known as Black Land. So after the 10 devastating plagues, uh, the, mo and the only way they came out was by the blood of the Lamb or the Passover feast. And it is a Passover feast because they were passing over from one place to another. Just like how we're passing over from this fourth age into the fifth age. And uh, so we're actually eating the Passover right now too. And so they, they had to eat the, the lamb and they had to put the blood on the four points of the door. And uh, this represents Yahshua and Messiah because Yahshua and Messiah is the true lamb. And there are four points of blood on his cross. It's also very cool because he, he calls himself the door and he is a door. So if he is a door and the blood has to be on, on the inside of our doors, time psychologically, then he is the door frame and he, he's the door and he's the in, he has to be on the inside of us now um, in order for us to pass over. Because there's a certain thing that animals do uh, in the wild. They sniff their offspring. So when the offspring is born, um, they'll sniff them. And if they smell like them, then they'll accept them. But if they don't smell like them, they will kill them. There's also a process known as grafting, where... If a mother dies after giving childbirth, they will smear the blood of the mother on the baby, and then they will present her. And it can't be of the mother that died. It has to be of the mother that's alive. And they'll smear the blood on her, or they'll put pieces of skin of her offspring if they died around the baby, and she'll sniff the baby. And the baby will smell like her offspring and she'll take care of it. So, and we'll get to that later. That, that's really cool because that's what Yahshua did to us. We were known as the wild olive tree. So Yahshua, through Yahshua and Messiah, we were grafted in to the family, Yahweh's family. And we now look like him. Because we're having to be conformed to the image of Yahshua the Messiah. So that's what Yahweh is looking for. He's looking at the hearts and he's looking at the minds of all the people he's called. And if he sees his son, then you'll go over into the fifth stage and you'll be with him forever. If he doesn't see his son in you, then you go to the lake of fire and you're in torment forever. That's that's just how it is. And I didn't make it like that. Yahweh did. So after the Passover feast uh, and the children of Israel, they came to the Red Sea. And there were two mountains on either side of them, the Red Sea in front of them. And Pharaoh and his host, or Satan and his host, behind them. So they cried out unto Yahweh and um could we get that? It says, Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh today, this day. Nine and 
No. Um, 14 and 13? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exit is, yep. You want me to pick it up a little bit or you just want where it says? Um, no, yeah. just where it says stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh to the. Okay. Um, and Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Right. Thank you. So Yahweh told Moses to lift up his rod, and he listened, and the sea was divided. Keep in mind, the sea was not divided by Moses' rod. It was divided by Yahshua the Messiah, who was actually there with them in, in bodily form, and they just didn't know it. So they, it was a three-day journey through the Red Sea, and, um, and there went with them a cloud. It was a fiery cloud uh, that, that was between the two camps. It was between Israel and it was between the Egyptians. So this fiery cloud reflected off the water. So it was like walking through the fire. And Yahshua was the one that was in the middle. He, he was the one in the cloud, Yahshua the Messiah. So as they got through it, the righteous, the type, the shadow of the righteous, walked through the fire and they didn't die. But the unrighteous, they got killed. They tried to walk through the fire and they died. So after this, the children of Israel, Moses and Yahshua the Messiah, at that time he wasn't known as Yahshua the Messiah, he was known as Joshua. They got to the wilderness of Sinai and Moses was instructed. He had three trips. Uh, the first two trips and um, the, law, the law was already out there. If we could zoom in on the, the part of chart where it shows uh, Yahweh speaking down the law, or it shows the panoramic vision, and it has, yep, that's it, thank you. So Moses has three trips, and during these trips, he sees, he receives the old covenant law, which was broken, because during this time and during the vision he was seeing, he didn't understand why the children of Israel were disobeying Yahweh. He hadn't seen the transgression yet. So he was mad, and according to the purpose, he threw down the first stones. And this represents the old covenant, showing that it would be taken away, it would vanish. And uh, so he had to go back up there and receive another type of stones. And in these trips, he saw the tabernacle. He saw the seven days of creation. Mo Yahweh had to give Moses a recapit recapitulation of the vision. So in other words, he just picked up where he left off and continued the vision. And he also had to bring some things to his remembrance because Moses did not remember everything. That's why there's two, uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 2 is an extension of Genesis 1. Because Yahweh told Moses to go to Yahshua and rehearse these things in his ears. And when he did, Yahweh, Elohim, being in that body as Yahshua, that being Yahshua the Messiah, knew Moses didn't remember everything, so he sent him back up at the mouth, and he showed him, he gave him a rerun of the creation. It's actually amazing, because, you know, it's the same thing with us. We have to come to class every day, or almost every day, because if we don't, we'll forget something, too. It's just how the, the mind works. We have finite minds, and um, that's the way Yahweh created it. So. Moses is given a pattern. He sees Elohim transfigure into a tabernacle pattern. This tabernacle is 
placed in the wilderness of Sinai, and it took nine months to build the tabernacle. And while Moses was in the mount, he couldn't watch the people build the tabernacle. So Yahshua filled certain people with his spirit so they would build the tabernacle. And then when Moses came down, he put the law in the Ark of the, uh, Ark of the Covenant, which represents the human head. Uh, could we pull up the man in the image of Elohim by the tabernacle, the pattern, tabernacle chart? Thank you. So, as we could see, our bodies are a tabernacle. So, the law being placed in the Ark of the Covenant, in reality, represents Yahweh Elohim being placed into a man because Yahweh Elohim is the law that's why it says in our hearts and in our minds that he will write it on our inward parts because basically what he's doing is Yahweh Elohim showing himself to a man and stepping into him that's basically what he's doing because he has the power to do that he has the power to enter into vessels. So, and uh, he did the same thing with David. With no, with uh, with Adam, when he created Adam, and he said he breathed into Adam the breath of life. What he did was he he just stepped into into Adam. That's what he did. He he stepped into the vessel and animated it. And he's been doing that ever ever since. He's the he he did it with us uh, in the fourth age. He did it with Doctor Kinley. Uh, he did it with the people in the third age when he would temporarily. Um, it's a little bit different in the third age because he would temporarily give them the Holy Spirit, but he would still animate them so they wouldn't die. He, he's been doing that all through the ages and dispensations. Yahshua the Messiah is the only man who has really been walking down through the ages and dispensations. And um, there's a certain chart that shows this. It's, uh, it's a testament chart. Uh, it looks like a brain. And it shows old night and new day on it. I don't know if you guys have that chart or not. Um, but if you do... Oh, you do. Great. Okay. So as you could see there on the middle heart, there's a white outline of a man. That represents Yahshua the Messiah walking down through the ages and dispensations. And it's Yahweh's purpose. So that's what he's doing. Just Yahweh created a purpose, manifested himself in the purpose, and is... And is doing the entire purpose himself. Um, don't get me wrong. We are doing things too. Like when we go and. Uh, like preach the gospel. And some of that. We are actually doing things. Um, Yahshua is causing us to do these things. And we do them. So we we are doing things too. It, it's. It, it's a unity. You know how like when you. Like Joel, Joel and Pam, you guys are, are a married couple. You two are a unity. If one person does something, it's registered as both of you guys are doing it, if that makes sense. So it's a unity. And, uh, and it, it's the same thing with us. So when Yashua Messiah does something in us, since it's a unity, we're also doing something. So, and uh, that, that's something I recently learned in uh, Honest Heart of Truth Seekers class yesterday. So back to the children of Israel. When after this tabernacle was built, they approached the Jordan River and they were told, they sent out spies into the land. They sent out 12 spies uh, and two came back with a good report and 10 came back with a bad report. The children of Israel believed the bad report. And so they were forced to wander. They were cursed and they had to wander the wilderness 
of Sinai for 40 years. During this time, all the old heads had to die. All the people that were born in Egypt and went over into the wilderness of Sinai died. That is a type and shadow of what's happening with us. The old self, or I'll use myself as an example. The old Connor is dying off, okay? Do Dr. Kinley would say the same thing where he said, you know, we don't want to hear old Henry C. Kinley. So it's a type and shadow of a changing of head, heads. Because that's what had to happen in the wilderness of Sinai, and that's what's happening to us. Our heads or our minds, our way of thinking, our perceptions, our uh, behavior, conduct, attitude, all, all things that, rep, that come from the most holy place are being changed. So, and uh, there was a new birth of 144,000, which went over into Cain's land. This is a type and shadow of also what we're going through because our old self is not going to inherit eternity. It never could. It was never allowed to. It was a carnally minded, satanic spirit that is not going to go into eternity. So the new birth in us is Yahshua the Messiah. I, I don't like using that word new birth, but what our soul wants. Yahweh converted our soul into the image of his son. So it's, uh, it's, it's new. It's not old anymore. And that's what's going into eternity. Uh, because as it was brought out in another class I was in, only Yahshua is going back to eternity. There's no, there's no one else in eternity. And uh, could we get that? There's, there's three that bear record in eternity. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. First John, first John, seven. But there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth: the Spirit and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Thank you. So the first image I need would be from the pattern or plan of salvation chart. It's uh, the one that shows the witnesses of blood, water, spirit, and then there it is. Thank you. So as you could see on the chart, if you zoom in on just that one plate, uh, yeah. Thank you. So it says unity of the spirit. And it says the Father, the Word, and the Holy Holy Spirit, these three are one. Mm -hmm. Yep. And these three bear record in heaven and they're one. And then the second image I need is. Uh, actually, I need two more images. The second one will be plate number three on the 40 plate chart, which would be the supernal nature of the alley. And then Is that what you want? Yes, that's what I want. So this is Yahweh Elohim Yahshua. This is the supernal nature, and this is the only man in eternity. Uh, as you could tell, there's no angels, there's no one else. And um, he's the beginning of the creation. He was, the, he is the first man, the, the very first man. That's why it says in the book that he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And uh, all the angels and everything abide within him. 
So the the angels are within him. The the physical creation is within him. We are are within him. This is what it means when it says in the body of Yahshua the Messiah. We are literally in the body of Yahshua the Messiah. We're not outside of him. And uh, another way to show this is he's the he he is the tabernacle. He is the as it says on the Moses chart, Elohim, the archetype, original pattern of the universe. Everything is made by this pattern and operates within this pattern. There's no escaping it. The, the pattern is Yahweh Elohim, who is Yahshua the Messiah. And uh, so uh, that, that's a good thing, very comforting thing to know. So then uh, there's one more image I needed, and it's on the Moses chart, where it shows Yahweh Elohim and the tabernacle. Five Thank minutes, you. Five minutes, um, Connor. Okay. All right. Thank you. So as you can see, it says Yahweh, Elohim, Yahshua, in red letters. So see? One spiritual embodiment. One universal spirit that everything abides within. So when, Mo when the children of Israel cross the Jordan River, Moses has to die first. Uh, Moses is a type and shadow of Yahshua and Messiah, but he dies off through disobedience by hitting a rock according to the purpose of Yahweh. So Yahshua, the, Yahshua can take the children of Israel over. Uh, just, just like us, you know, all everything had to die off for us. So Yahshua, the Messiah, could take us over. And when the children of Israel get into Canaan's land, they they had the tabernacle and they built the temple uh, by the instructions of Yahweh. Yahweh Elohim Yahshua gave David instructions to build the tabernacle. He gave it to his son because his hands were covered in blood, which is also another type and shadow of uh, Yahweh giving his. Uh, if I could say it this way, his power and authority and all these things to his lesser form, which is Elohim, which is also known as the warrior son. So he gave it to his son in principle. But we got to keep in mind, Yahweh doesn't really have a son like that. Like we're thinking he has, he, he is the son. He, it, son just means lesser form or sonship degree. And uh, a good example of this, I can give this in my physical life. Recently, my dad was talking to me. And uh, the, the way Yahweh set it up was really beautiful. I was on the ground looking up, speaking to my physical father. And he was in an exalted position. Like he was in a higher position or higher form. And it's the same thing with Yahweh Elohim. That's why when Yahshua the Messiah came in, he was giving, even though that was Yahweh, it was Yahweh in a lesser form. And he was saying, my father, and because it, it's just a different form, uh, if that made any sense. So in, the, in Canaan's land, the, when the children of Israel had to build the temple, the tabernacle all the instruments that were in the tabernacle were put into the temple and then they were multiplied. So it's a type and shadow of what's happening with us. These tabernacles that we're in, these physical tabernacles, they're called, it's called, and it says in the scriptures, uh, that our body is in the temple. So, but it's going to be manifested at the end of this probationary period that we're being put back into the temple. So all, all of us, which represent vessels, it's going to be manifested. It's already happening. We're already in the temple, but it's going to be manifested that we're going to be put back into the temple. And uh, is my five minutes up? Or do I have more time? Uh, it's up. Sorry. Okay. It's all good.
It's okay. With those words, I'll say hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Connor. Our next speaker will be Dr. Sheree Williams. Good evening, class. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. I thoroughly enjoyed the testimony uh, of the previous speaker. It was very, very edifying and he laid a, a excellent foundation and covered a lot of ground. So um, we're just going to try to uh, pick up where the previous speaker left off. Um, the scripture lesson this evening was talking about Abraham offering up his son, Isaac. And of course, um, that reminds me of uh, the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. If we can get that, please, in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, um, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Yahshua died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is the Holy Spirit, Yahshua the Messiah, speaking through the Apostle Paul, and he's declaring what the gospel is. Now, before I came to class, being reared up some 18 years in Mount Moriah Baptist Church in Winter Park, I was led to believe that the gospel was the four gospels. The gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But uh, that those books is not the gospel. Those books are the um, uh, biology. That's not the right word. Um, in other words, it talks about the, 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 the birth of Yahshua the Messiah and his life and what all he did, you know, uh, in his life and in his ministry. And so uh, here the Holy Spirit through Paul is saying what the gospel is. Huh? Biography. Biography. Yes, thank you. <laughs> of Yahshua the Messiah. All right. So he said that we could be saved in the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah and that we should be standing in the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. And the bottom line is we want to be saved, right? Uh, that's why our, uh, our first aim states to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and as he actually exists. And then the 10th aim says uh, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the earth state. So now we know that Yahshua declared in John 17 and three that eternal life is to know the heavenly father Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua the Messiah whom thou hast sent. So that declaration that Yahshua uh, said in John 17 and three in his prayer there, is manifest here with the aims that uh, the Holy Spirit, Yahshua Messiah, has set up through the founder. Um, we didn't have 10 all the time. If you know anything about the history of the school, we had a few at first, I, think, I don't know if it was three or four, and then as the years went by, they added. So um, by the time he Seven. took the uh, flesh off, then we had 10, 10 aims, uh, which has to correlate, of course, with the 10, uh, uh, the 10 laws, you know, spoken from the mountain there. And we know that there were also not just those 10, but there were 613 
uh, laws, ordinances, and judgments that the children of Israel had to keep. But from a spiritual and psychological standpoint, you know, we got 10 aims down here now to correlate with, with, with the 10 laws, uh, you know, the big 10, as they say, you know, in, in the religious world. All right. So now keeping in mind the gospel of Yahshua, the Messiah, we're going to go back a little bit. Uh, let's go back in time because we know when, when, when Moses went up into the mountain um, on that second principal trip as well as the third principal trip it was in the mount sinai in a vision that yahweh showed moses the genealogies of the flesh from adam all the way down in other words moses sees from the beginning until the end and then john the revelator on uh, uh the isle of patmos he's seeing from the end to the beginning and the vision that the founder had, Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley, uh, included the vision that Moses saw, included <laughs> the visions of all your patriots and prophets uh, and judges and whatnot, all in, in between, and included John's uh, vision and revelation on, on the Isle of Patmos, you see. So, uh, so therefore his vision Incredible. is, it, it is going to confirm the things that they saw, you know, that is penned in the Bible. And that's why the founder, he said, look, if what I'm teaching can not be verified by what's written in that Bible, then I'm just a liar, just like all the rest of these preachers out here, you know. And that's why we've been instructed, as the first speaker did, to keep our finger in the book, you see, because uh, what the founders saw in their vision and revelation is what's written in our scriptures. But see, before coming into the school, even though having a Bible and your religious world have a Bible, but they don't have the teacher. And we, we, we've learned since being in school, and it's penned in uh, John 14, 26, that Yahshua the Messiah is the teacher in the school. He's the teacher, he's the comforter, and he's gonna bring back to our remembrance whatever he said unto us, right? All right, so Yahshua teaches by beginning at Moses, going to the, the prophecy, and then you can see how he fulfilled it, and then we're converted into the spiritual reality. All right, so now, when we take the uh, uh, the vision that was given to Moses, right? We know that Moses, he wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the law. That's at the beginning of the Bible. Then all the way at the end, where John the Revelator, he also wrote five books, which was St. John, so-called Saint John, first, second, and third John, that's four books, and then the book of Revelations. So you have John the Revelator writing five books at the end and Moses uh, writing five books at the beginning. The first five books in the beginning is the law. And then your prophecy from Joshua, truly Joshua to Malachi, 34 books, which makes 39 books, which are the scriptures. And Joshua the Messiah, uh, said to the people in John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. So the law and the prophets are Yahshua's two witnesses. That's why he said in John, I mean, in Matthew 5, 17, that he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but he had come to fulfill because the law and the prophets are his two witnesses. All right. So now when we go back here, uh, Thank you. Uh, this is a good chart. And we begin back here uh, with Moses, seeing that he wrote the first five books. Let's look at Noah for an example. Um, at the end of the antediluvian age, uh, Yahweh gave Noah a vision. And he told Noah that the end of all flesh was come unto him talking about Yahweh, the end of all flesh had come unto him. 
And he was talking about how the people were so wicked and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously, you know? And due to that fact, he said that he was going to destroy all flesh off of the face of the earth. So he instructed Noah in that vision to build himself an ark. And the ark is an upper deck, a middle deck, and a lower deck. Three decks to that ark, but only one ark, proving the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three on one, as the previous speaker pointed out. There's only one window, which is pent in Genesis, called a skylight. And there's one door in the side, in the side of the ark. And the reason you have one window or one skylight is because Joshua in his ministry, he told the people, I am the light of the world, right? And also the reason why you have one door in the side of that ark, Joshua said in his ministry, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. All right. So at the end of this age, if you did not enter into this ark, after Noah had preached for 120 years. See, that's, that shows you the mercy of Yahweh. See, when he told, gave him that vision, with Yahweh, it was over with. It was done. But what he did during the preparation of the ark and the preaching of Noah to the people for that 120 years, see, the people had 120 years to repent from their wicked ways and to enter into that ark. So that was a grace period, if you will, at the end of that uh, anti deluvian age, right? They had 120 years. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, when the 120 years were up, only Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives went into the ark being eight souls. And when they went into the ark, they sat in that ark for seven whole days with the door open. And he kept beckoning them to the people to come into the ark that they might not perish, that they might be saved. Because he told them it was going to rain. Well, they didn't know what rain was. Uh, it had never rained on the face of the earth when Noah was preaching to the people that it was going to rain. So for 120 years, Noah was preaching to the people about something they had never seen before, had never experienced before, because Yahweh used to water the vegetation when a mist that came up from the ground. And you can read that uh, in Genesis there. And uh, if you've done your research, just as uh, I can see that the previous speaker did, he did an excellent job in, in setting that up. And, and, and it was very edifying that, that he brought forth. So anyway, at the end of the 120 years and seven days, if you will, Yahweh shut the door of that ark. And it's in the scriptures that way, that Yahweh shut the door. And you read in the scriptures that uh, Yahweh shut doors that no man can open. And he also opened doors that no man can shut. You know what I'm saying? So when he shut that door, it was a done deal. So it was only eight souls saved at that time. So now uh, it rained 40 days and 40 nights, right? And then the ark was on the waters for a year and 10 days. If my memory doesn't fail me, they were in that ark, you know, and every, they, everything that they needed uh, was in that ark, you see. All right. So now the people died. They drowned in, in the water there. But the eight souls were in that ark and they were saved in that ark. So you got a principle of a death, you see, and a burial of the dead and that water there, you see. But the, the eight souls were saved. They were destroyed in the water. But Noah and his family were saved by the water because that ark resurrected right on up that water and rested there on Mount Arab as the uh, waters began to uh, abate. All right, so that's the principle of a death, a burial, a resurrection, and an ascension. 
at the end of that age. And you know, uh, Yahweh brought it to my attention and I had never really even thought about it. That at the time that Yahweh killed these people because of their wickedness, the law had not even been given yet. I'm talking about the law of Moses, as it's called. The law mm -hmm. wasn't even given yet. But yet and still, he said that the people were wicked and their imaginations were, were wicked. You understand what I mean? And because of that, he destroyed, he told Noah he's going to destroy them. But he had not yet given no law. Isn't that something to think about? But it just goes mm -hmm. forth to show that Yahweh has always hated evil, even before the law was given. You get what I'm saying? So he destroyed them uh, because of their wickedness, even, even at the end of the antediluvian age. All right. So then um, you go into the post-diluvian age, which was opened up uh, by Noah offering up sacrifices unto Yahweh. He offered up uh, many sacrifices unto Yahweh uh, for thanksgiving, for saving he and his family. Okay, so in other words, the post diluvian age was open up with a spilling of blood. Now I failed to mention, yes, thank you, that at the beginning of the antediluvian age, right, we know and it's penned and documented there in Genesis that when Yahweh Elohim walked upon the face of the earth, right, and he began to create the creation, uh, the physical creation that is, you know, um, the whole earth was uh, inundated or buried or covered over with water. You know what I'm saying? So the antediluvian age, you see, it, it started out by the whole earth being buried in water. You get what I mean? So at the end of that age with Noah, there's no wonder that it has to go out by being buried in water. Because Yahweh declared the end from the beginning. You get what I mean? So you got water manifest there in the antediluvian age. So when he goes into the post-diluvian age, he offers up the sacrifices and spill blood at the beginning of that age. All right? All right. So now as we uh, examine this age here, let's see. Let's go on down to, I think it's... Um, Sodom and Gomorrah. This is dealing with Abraham. Um, let me think now. Abraham, is this before or after the offering of Isaac? I'm trying to think uh, in my mind. But anyway, um, you got the... Uh, the uh, it's before. It is before. Sodom and Gomorrah. Thank, yeah. you. thank you. Thank you. All right. So you got Sodom and Gomorrah manifest here. And once again, also before the law was given, you got Sodom and Gomorrah and the type of lifestyle that was manifest in, that, in those twin cities. Yahweh has said he was told Abraham he's going to destroy the twin cities because of, the, because of the wickedness of the people. You know what I'm saying? And so, and once again, the law hasn't been given yet. It's something to think about. You know what I'm saying? So, when you go in there and you read about Sodom and Gomorrah and, and what was going on. Now, see, before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Abraham, he pleaded for the twin cities. And he said, well, if I could find 50 righteous men, would you spare the cities? Yahweh said, if you could find 50, I'll spare them. And then he worked his way all the way down. Uh, I think it's 10 is the last number. Uh, uh, if I could find 10, would you spare the city and all that? And at the end of the day, when it was all said and done, he couldn't, he couldn't find none except for his nephew, Abraham's nephew, Lot, and his family were the only righteous in that city. And what Yahweh did, he sent two angels. And the previous speaker was talking about two men and something else he was talking about. But uh-huh, you got the two angels, they go to Lot's house and they typify the law and the prophets, right? And they warn Lot, say, look, uh, get yourself together. You got to come up out of here and leave this wicked city because Yahweh is going to destroy the wicked city. And so uh, what happened was the, 
the wicked men in the city, they saw the angels that went into Lot's house, but they didn't look like angels to the men in the city. They look like two men, right? Uh, as they go to the to Lot's house. So they began to press on the house on the house, the door of the house, and bamming on the door. And they and so Lot goes outside and shuts the door behind him to see what the men wanted. And uh, they wanted that the men, the men of the city wanted the two men that they saw came in Lot's house. And so uh, uh, Lot says, no, don't, don't do this wicked thing. Don't do this wicked thing. I'll give you my virgin daughters. I got two uh, virgin daughters, never known a man. I'll give you them, the, my daughters. But to these men, don't do this wicked thing. You know what I'm saying? That's something to think about. <laughs> you know, who would offer up their virgin daughters to, to wicked men? But he wanted to spare the angels. You know what I'm saying? That's something to think about. And so uh, they said, we don't want, we don't want the, the women. We want the men. And he said, don't do so wickedly. And they pressed upon him and everything. So as you read about it, you read that the angels opened the door, snatched, grabbed uh, Abraham and snatched him into the house. I mean, what did I say? Lot. I mean, I'm sorry, Lot snatched them back into the house. And um, then the angels smote the wicked men uh, with blindness. And you read in the scripture that they couldn't find the door. You get what I'm saying? So, uh, <laughs> and, and they wearied themselves. The scripture say they wearied themselves trying to find the door. Oh my goodness. And we know that Yahshua the Messiah is the true door. You understand what I mean? The wicked... They can't find the door right now today. You understand? Uh, 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 those of us in this school, you see what I'm saying? Uh, we didn't find the door on our own because Yahshua told, told his disciples, even back there in his ministry, he said that, that he had chosen them. They didn't choose him. So it's no different down here now. Yahweh is the one that chooses us. We don't choose him. Uh, 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 it, all of our testimonies, we just don't have time to hear everyone's testimony, how you ended up in class. But you, you, you didn't really choose to be in this class. It was one situation or another where you looked up and there you were sitting up in class. You know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. wonderful. Yahweh's mercy does endure forever. So anyway, so... Uh, so finally, uh, it was time for, for Lot and his family to leave the wicked city. So they are leaving the wicked city. And Yahweh had instructed and say, look, whatever you do, don't turn around and look. Just keep pressing forward and just leave this, the twin cities, the wicked cities. Just leave it and don't look back. You understand? So uh, Lot's wife, you know, that was her hometown. And that's where she was born and raised, whatever. So as they are leaving, uh, Yahweh is destroying the twin cities. You know what I'm saying? That's a death and a barrier. But, but Lot and his family, they are being uh, resurrected out of there. You understand? And, 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 and saved. So that's a death, a barrier, and, and a resurrection in principle. But what happened was she hears all the, the screams and all that of the people. And her heart just bled and she just couldn't help herself, Lot's wife. And she turned and looked and she turned into a pillar of fire. And, you know, I mean, a pillar of salt, I'm sorry, a pillar of salt. And salt is used as a preserver, right? So in other words, what she saw had to be preserved. It wasn't time yet for it to, to be known how that Yahweh uh, uh, does destroy. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 as, and, and it's prefiguring, you know, down here at the end, you understand how at the universal revelation, how he's going to destroy, you know, the elements, the earth and the elements, the heavens and everything else, you know, it, it's prefiguring that. And it wasn't meant to be seen and known at that time. You understand? Uh, fire and brimstone. That's what it was. You get what I mean? So anyway, uh, so um, that's why she had to be turned to, to a pillar of, of salt. And they went on. So you see in a death, burial, resurrection at the end of the antediluvian age, and you see in now the post diluvian is manifest here with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. So once again, Yahweh hates wickedness way before the law was even given. All right. So now let's go on over to to uh, the scripture lesson. I don't mean uh, read it. I'm just gonna express it. All right. So then, what happened was Yahweh gave 
Abraham a son in his old age when he was beyond uh, childbearing and so was his wife. I think if my memory don't fail me, I think, um, uh, 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 what her name was, uh, Sarah uh, was 90 years old and what was he, 100 or 99? Okay, 99 years old at a time that um, Isaac was brought forth. You get what I'm saying? So in other words, also with the conception and birth of Isaac, it's also a principle of death, burial, and a resurrection because in, in essence, her womb was dead. You understand what I'm saying? And Yahweh just placed that child in there, you know, as a fulfillment of his promise to Abraham that he would bless his seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sands of the seashore. You know what I mean? Uh, and and uh, so therefore he had to give him Isaac, the promised son. And Isaac is a type of Yahshua the Messiah. You get what I mean? So of course, uh, he was given a, a child, Ishmael, 15 years before Isaac was born through Hagar. Uh, oh boy, that's a whole nother thing. I'm not getting into all that. But anyway, uh, Hagar, which is Sarah's uh, handmaiden, she, she, Sarah said, go into my handmaiden. She'll give you a son, whatever, whatever. So uh, Ishmael is born 15 years before Isaac and Isaac is born. And when, and when, when Sarah was told she was going to have a son, she, she laughed because she's 90 years old. She's like, whatever, you know, all these years, you know, I'm too old now, you know, and she laughed. So nevertheless, here come Isaac. So in other words, the womb was dead and Yahweh just laid him in there. He's buried in there. And then after nine months, he resurrects on out of there. You see, in principle, death, burial, and resurrection. So he told him to offer up his son. They go up into the mountain, as we read in the scripture lesson. And uh, it's in there where Isaac say, well, father, he says, uh, and mind you now, at the time that Isaac was going to be offered up, Ishmael is 40 years old. And being that he's 15 years older than his brother Isaac, that's how you figure out that Isaac wasn't a little boy, as I thought in the church. He was 25 years old. His dad is over 100. You know what I'm saying? And 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 he could easily overtake his dad. But no, he's an humble soul. You understand what I mean? He's a type of Yahshua the Messiah, like unto a lamb. You understand? And uh, he submits himself unto his father's will. So the point is, he said, well, Father, we got the wood. We got the fire. Well, where's the sacrifice? And we read in the scripture, say Yahweh will provide himself a sacrifice, you know? So he laid the wood in order and he put uh, 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 Isaac on there. And that's when Isaac began to sweat, great drops of sweat when he realized that he's a sacrifice and he went to kill him. But the angel stayed his hand and told him, don't do nothing uh, to kill Isaac. So in Abraham's mind, you know, uh, he realized that if Yahweh can give me a son in my old age, you understand what I mean? He is the power to resurrect him from the dead. So he did not hesitate to, to, to uh, kill um, Isaac, but he stayed his hand. And in his mind, uh, Isaac was dead, buried, and resurrected in the mind of Abraham there. So you got a death, burial, and resurrection in the mind of Abraham because he wasn't going to hesitate. To, to, to offer him up. So he told him to take the ram in the thickets, you understand, and offer him up instead of offering up Isaac. So he did that, you see, and they he, that that ram got to be caught in the thickets, held by the two horns, like unto the law and the prophets, you know what I'm saying? And the ram was killed instead of Abraham. You understand what I'm saying? And, and, and the blood will, will shed there. But you see in the principle of a death burial, and a resurrection there with the with Isaac there in the heart and mind of Abraham and his life was spared. All right. So we like uh, the previous speaker was talking about that uh, uh, during uh, this, you got Abraham, you had three families, a uh, famine during Abraham's time, a famine during uh, Isaac's time and a famine during Jacob's time, and the previous speaker was talking about during Jacob's time with the 12 sons going down in Egypt seeking food. And uh, in a process of time, we know that they end up in bondage, but Yahweh brought them out. And he had to bring them out by the killing of a lamb. Uh, and they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea under Moses. That's a, a death and a burial, and they resurrect 
into the wilderness of Sinai. Now at the expiration of the 40 year period, they are at the Jordan River and uh, Moses is told to go up into Mount Nebo and he dies. And they're to mourn Moses' death for 30 days. And then after the 30 days, Yahweh uh, told them to get their victuals ready for three days. And they're gonna cross the Jordan going into Canaan's land to get their natural inheritance. So uh, that's the principle of 33. And then they cross the Jordan. You see, that's why Yahshua the Messiah has to be 33 years of age when he hit that cross, you see 33 and they crossed the Jordan. So when Yahshua hit the cross, he's 33. Yahshua is fulfilling the law and the prophets. And so they cross this here Jordan here and, uh, and go on in and get their natural inheritance. You get what I'm saying? So you got the death of Moses and they are uh, buried or baptized, you see, in this uh, Jordan River because the Jordan River humped up just like the Red Sea did. So that's a death of Moses. They're buried in the Jordan and they go into Canaan's land, uh, a resurrection where they get their natural inheritance there. All right. So then we come all the way down to Yahshua the Messiah. He's got to fulfill the law and the prophets, right? He fulfills uh, Passover. He fulfills baptism. He fulfills washing of feet because of the priest being washed in the tabernacle and the temple. He's got to fulfill everything written in the law and in the prophets. You get what I mean? So at the expiration of the three and a half years of his ministry, after he's finished fulfilling the law and the prophets, he's got to down that cross because all of those deaths all the way down from Adam all the way down to Yahshua and Messiah is prefiguring or pointing out Yahshua and the Messiah's death on that cross. You get what I'm saying? Uh, he's buried in Joseph's new tomb. tomb. You come down here at the bottom of the elementary chart. I'm going to skip the baptism. But you see he fulfilled baptism and all of that. All right. So he dies out there on that cross. You see what I'm saying? Uh, he got to have four points of blood on him. You see fulfilling down in Egypt, they had four points of blood on the door there. So he's the true door. He says, I am the door. You got to have four points of blood on him. Uh, they can't break his bones because they couldn't break the bones of the lamb in Egypt, right? So they got to pass over Yahshua and break the bones of the two men crucified with him, but he was already dead. So they pierce him in the side, out comes blood and water. You see, and he had already given up the spirit. So that's blood, water, spirit. And so after he died, they begged for his body, they put him in Joseph's new tomb, and he fulfills the Sabbath, you understand, because the Sabbath started that Friday night, 6 p.m., they, they have to get him in there before the Sabbath, so he's laying in the tomb, his heart isn't beating, he's not breathing, his eyes aren't batting, nothing. he's the only one that could truly fulfill the Sabbath by laying there, not moving a muscle, you get what I'm saying, so then he resurrects the next morning, early the next day, on that Sunday morning, uh, a quickening spirit, and he teared on the earth plain for 40 days. So you got the death of Yahshua. He's buried in, in the uh, tomb. He resurrects a quickening spirit or spiritual body, tears for 40 days. So you see the blood and water coming from his side. You understand? Uh, uh, and he gave up the spirit. Then when he resurrects from the grave, it has to be 40 days he has to tarry there before he ascends until his heavenly father, Yahweh. You see, as you see here at the top of that plate there, um, when he's ascending there uh, and the 11 sees him ascend. He said, and in light matter, will he come back? And 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, the next plate over, the Jews or the Hebrews received the gift of the Holy Spirit in the upper room. And as the previous speaker was talking about, you see, how that, uh, uh, um, how that, uh, 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 an orphan, uh, uh, lamb or orphan of any kind of animal in the wild, you understand, they will take, uh, 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 uh the, the hide of a baby that had died from that particular mother and put on that orphan, you know, uh, lamb or what have you, so that she would receive him. You get what I'm saying? So then you look at seven years from the day of Pentecost down at Cornelius' house, you see Peter sent down there to preach gospel to the Gentiles, whom we all are. You understand? And see, by the preaching of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, guess what's happening, you guys? Uh, it's over in Revelations, the seventh chapter, where it talks about 
uh, I think it's Revelation 7 and uh, let's see, I think it's 14. Can you read Revelation 7, 14? We're talking about that blood and how that we're grafted in. We're that wild olive tree if, as he was talking about. You understand what I'm saying? And we're grafted in. We, we, we are um, sons by adoption, if you will. You get it? The Gentiles. You got Revelations, I think it's 7 and 14. Is that, is that right? Five minutes, Sheree. Okay. 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 Uh, no, seven and fourteen. No, um, you want to say being grafted in? No, I want well, about the blood being, uh, being washed in the blood. Their souls, their the rose being washed in the blood, made white in the blood of the lamb. Okay, uh, that's seven and I think nine. Okay. After he, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, all of nations and kindreds and people of tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. It said, "All nations." See, that includes uh, Hebrews and heathens or Gentiles who we are. Go ahead. Um, and crying with a loud voice, I'm trying to see where it says blood, and crying with a loud voice saying, salvation to our L, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne, about the elders of four living creatures, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped Yahweh. Okay, drop down. I think it is 14. It is 14. It is 14. Mm-hmm. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There it is. Came yeah. out of great tribulations, great trials and tribulations, and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Now the robes typify the souls of man. So by the preaching of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, our souls are being washed white in the blood of the lamb. That's the point I want to get at because he was talking about that blood of, uh, of the lamb, which is Yahshua the Messiah, making us acceptable unto Yahweh through Yahshua the Messiah. You get what I'm saying? All right. So then you read over there in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 13. Is that where it is? Uh, baptism. Is that it, y'all? The baptism. Spiritual baptism. 12, 13. Uh, it's it's baptism. one spirit, one, one yeah. spirit. Yes. Yeah. Read that. For as the body is one and have many members and of all members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is the Messiah. For by one spirit are we all baptized unto one body, mm -hmm. whether we be Jews or Greeks, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink unto one spirit. That's it. All right. So you see in Revelations talking about the souls being washed white in the blood of the Lamb. So now by the preaching of the gospel, by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. You get what I'm saying? You see, and then also you read over there and I think it's John 7, 38. It says that um, that he's gonna, uh, 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 out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So you got the blood, you got the being baptized in living water, you understand? And you're being baptized in the Holy Spirit. My point is blood, water, and spirit. And here we are in the fourth age. So there's your blood, water, spirit, and 40 down here in the present kingdom age where we are by the preaching of the unadulterated gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. And see, Yahshua the Messiah in us is our only hope of glory. He's our mode of transportation or our arcus of salvation back unto Yahweh because he's only saving his son, Yahshua the Messiah. That's why our only hope of glory is to be in him. And we got to be that bride clothed in the sun. You get what I'm saying? That's in Yahshua the Messiah and he in us. All praises and glory going to Yahweh our Elohim through Yahshua the Messiah, our Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sheree. Okay, our final speaker this evening will be the Vice President of the Tampa class, Dr. Latara Burley. 
Pam, would you read for her? Oh, wow, me. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, well, let's see here. I was very edified um, from the first two previous speakers. I was just enjoying <laughs> and taking notes. Um, wow, it's, it's been a lot that's been covered. I don't, let's see. Um, while um, the previous speakers were talking, I was just writing down everything. So many things were just hitting me. And, um, you know, of course, always, you know, I, I thank Yashua for that, for just, you know, using a brethren to edify everyone. Um, it's, it's so much that I was just thinking about when um, Connor and Sheree was talking and I just jotted down a few notes um, while they were talking, I just probably, you know, see if I can wrap it up, but, um, oh my goodness, let's just get, well, well, first of all, you know, when we come into this, you know, teaching, it's, it's just so amazing how Yahweh uses, you know, many different vessels and all of us come from different backgrounds, but like, you know, Sheree was saying how, you know, we didn't seek Yahweh or we, we wasn't um, searching for him, that we didn't choose him, that he chooses us. And, you know, how neither one of us could come up with this or even think of anything like this. And that's how you know, like, this is truly a divine you know, teaching that no man could come up with anything like this. So um, I want to get where, you know, Connor just laid that foundation. He was talking about the law and um, let's just go back. And I'm just gonna just probably just, you know, go over a couple of things because they laid a beautiful foundation. I mean, it was just beautiful um, in Exodus. Um, a couple of things that just, you know, stood out to me when he was talking about the law of Moses and how going back to that law, can you get um, in Exodus, uh, is it three where Yahweh, um, well, Moses questioned Yahweh and, you know, he was talking about him not being able to speak well. And so when we come into this class, um, you know, we learned that the first five books of the Bible, like they were talking about was um, Exodus, num Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and um, did I say it right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, yeah. And can we just read that really quick? Yeah, so um, it's in Exodus 4 and 10. And Moses said unto Yahweh, O Yahweh, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, no, since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Okay, and I'm going to interrupt you here, and so I apologize ahead of time. But when he was talking about that law, and he said that he was um, slow of speech, so he wasn't basically he couldn't speak well so moses being represented of the law so the law was not perfect and we know that because moses was not um perfect moses was a shepherd in the egyptians eyes moses was something that you didn't look upon he was like basically like of a lower class and then he he's telling Yahweh, not only is he a lower class, but he can't even speak well. So even if he was to go to Pharaoh, he's looked upon like, who are you? Huh. You know what I mean? To go up into this king, you know, of basically Egypt. Well, what Egypt was kind of like the world center, like a like America, like the king of the earth or whatever. So Moses says. I am a slow of speech or slow of tongue, so I can't even speak right, but keep going. And Yahweh said unto him, who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seen or the blind? Have mm -hmm. not I Yahweh? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. 
Mm -hmm. So Yahweh's telling Moses that he is going to be with his mouth and he's going to teach the law as, as you would put it. He's going to teach you, which is Moses representing the law, what you're going to say and what you're going to do. Right. So he's setting this up from the very beginning. I keep reading. And he said, oh, O oh, master, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And so now he's saying, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So now he's saying, Aaron, thy brother right because they are brothers the law and you have Aaron which is our brother he said he can speak well so you have a principle of something that is you know made um not perfect but then you have a principle of something that is made perfect with a speak uh someone who can speak well so his speech is perfect there's nothing um wrong with his tongue so you have two principles of something that is not perfect and then something that is made perfect now keep reading and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth and i will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do okay now you got to read that over i'm sorry read that one oh, slower okay that's okay and thou shalt speak unto him and, put and thou shalt speak. so moses yahweh said now moses you're going to speak. So the law is going to speak, right? And then he said, keep going. And put words in his mouth. Now you're going to put words, Moses, into the prophet's mouth. So now you're going to be unto a law. He's going to be the prophet. You're the law, which is made not perfect, but you're going to speak to the prophet, which is can speak well, which is made better than what you can speak basically so you're going to speak to i'm going to speak to you moses i'm going to speak to you with representing the law you're going to speak to aaron representing a prophet and read and i will be with thy mouth and with mm -hmm. his mouth and will mm -hmm. teach you what ye shall do right so yahweh is saying he's going to be with the law and he's going to be with the prophets and he's saying and he is going to teach you what to do so that so it's like things like that we go over over we go over these things all the time in class but you see it's it's the principles of it Yahweh setting this thing up from the very beginning teaching you saying because Moses was was like until uh he was a type he was a shadow of something he wasn't he wasn't the reality of it and then it talks about in the book how the law was made for a, for an example right and so moses was made like for an example of of aaron he's he's speaking to him he's speaking to the prophet but the prophet is going to be the one that's going to speak but they're going to go together they're working together but through the spirit of yahweh and yahweh said he's going to teach them what to do and so when we come into a reality of it when it's when it's made known when Yahshua died, buried, and resurrects, and he teaches us, but it's not, it's the same law, but I will say this way, it's not that physical law, it's the same law, but get Jeremiah 31 and 31, and then get for me when it talks about the law is made, um, it, it, in the scriptures, when talking about the law is made, uh, I think it's Romans, the eighth chapter. Jeremiah 31. 31. Do you want mm -hmm. that? Term? Behold, mm -hmm. the day come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring. Okay, pause. I'm sorry, Sherry. I'm going to no. interrupt. Okay, so Paul, so he's saying this law or this covenant, the same one, he said that he's going to. Um, make a new one it's not going to be like the old one not like the, the one that he made with the house of israel 
when he took them out of the land of Egypt. So if this was perfect, right? If this law was perfect, if Moses represented law was perfect, he would have been the one that could carry the children of Israel up out of Egypt into wilderness and up into Canaan's land. But see, Moses was representative of that physical law, right? Because he gave it to the people, but they were looking at the flesh. They were looking at Moses. And so Moses had to be cut off because he couldn't carry them over. And so, um, you know, it, Connor, when he was talking about how um, um, uh, Joshua or Joshua was down there in the land of Egypt and he was walking around and he was seeing the affliction of the children of Israel. See, because he always said that he was going to come down. He was so from, from the very beginning and we didn't even we didn't even realize this prior to coming into class. So even when we did come into class, you know, it had to be revealed to us that Yahweh, before he even told Moses to go down, he said, I have come down to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. I have heard their cry and seen the affliction, you know, by reason of their taskmasters. So Yahweh using Moses as a, I would say like, as a forefront or forefront man, but he's saying that he has come down, but he's using the law and the prophets to represent what you're going to do, what, what, what Yahweh is causing uh, the children of Israel to do. And also because they had to build that tabernacle pattern, but it was through Moses and it was through Aaron, which was representing of the high priest and there, there were things that they had to do, but it was through those two men, the law and the prophets. But Moses had to get cut off, you know, because Yahweh or Yahshua, he manifested himself as um, Joshua. He was down here the whole time. And then he brought them up out of the land of um, Egypt. He brought them through the waters, um, divided waters of the Red Sea, because when he was talking about astral projecting, how it talks about how um, Joshua was down there, but even that cloud, which was representing, um, you know, that Holy Spirit, which went in front of them because it talked about it led them out of, you know, the land of Egypt. They didn't follow them. It led them out of their land of Egypt. And, but then it was, um, what it said, it said it was a pillar of, light unto them unto the children of israel but unto the egyptians it was darkness unto them so so they didn't come near each other so joshua um led them into uh, canaan's land which was like the promised land but that law had to be cut off and just like um sherry i didn't even let you finish keep reading <laughs> that's okay behold the days come saith yahweh that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And so they had to break it because the law was not made perfect. Just like Moses' speech, it was not perfect, but it had to be through um, uh, two witnesses, through a law, not only that physical law, but it had to be by a prophet. And then Yahweh said, that's how he's going to speak to the children of Israel. And even that's how he speak to us. That is the, the correction is, is through the mouth of uh, two or three witnesses. So, so when you look at that physical law with Moses and how... Um, you know, um, Moses said that I, I am, you know, not perfect in speech, but but of a slow tongue. But also Moses stuttered over and over and over again. But see, through the stuttering or through the through the repetition or through the imperfection, I would say through that imperfection, what, you know, we look at through the imperfections of people looking at oh why do we have to keep going back to this law why do we have to keep repeating ourselves over and over again but see you doing that through the law because it because it talks about even the messiah said um and uh where did he say um luke 24 and he's saying and beginning at moses beginning at the the law beginning at the i say the 
imperfection or, or something, someone that couldn't speak well, or stuttered or repeated itself over and over again. That's how Yahweh spoke to them. That's how Yahweh teaches us. That's how he bring us up out of, you know, our, our, our physical, our spiritual, I would say, um, land of Egypt that we try to, that we're trying to get up out of and come into the, the, promised land which is unto the messiah because that's what's going to bring us unto the messiah is that law and through the prophets and so um it talks about in romans the eighth chapter how the law which was not i think it says not perfect or made non effect or something like that um i can start it where it says um i can either start at one or for for what the law could not do yeah just keep start Start wherever you feel you need to start at. Um, eight, eight and three for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Yahweh mm -hmm. sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Right. So it, so it talks about, again, the law was weak through the flesh because that's the only thing that they they could understand they couldn't understand spiritual things and even Yahshua was talking about um when he was when he was talking to them and it was like tell us about these things and Yahshua said if i tell you about i think he said um i might be misquoting like physical things or something like that and if i tell you about spiritual things you know how would you understand it how would how would you you know know it and so it's it, it here is talking about it was weak it was through the flesh it was you know keep going that that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit right after, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh not after the, the physical law um you know us doing physical things and, and thinking that um still to this day people think that that's their you know righteousness that's their joy that's their prize that that the flesh basically a carnal carnal minded being carnally minded basically because that's what Yahweh gave Moses so everybody's saying so if Yahweh gave Moses this law then we must have to we must do the same thing. You know, he gave them the tabernacle and they had all these laws and ordinances. So we have to do the same thing. But no, it was made weak. It says this law was physically made weak and is represented by Moses. Yahweh is showing us this. It's very evident. But we, you have to go back and see these things. You have to go back to like repeat these things over and over again to get an understanding of it. Um, is there any more there? Well, this whole chapter is just so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It kind of goes on um, and on, but. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so that was one thing. And then um, another thing, um, when uh, they were talking, when uh, Karna was talking, he was talking about um, putting on that new man, how that old man have to die, and how um, Moses, uh, not Moses, well, the children of Israel, the first, that first generation came up out of the land of Egypt and how they had to die in the wilderness and that the new generation, 144,000, uh, which they came up out of, um, were born in the wilderness and they came into uh, Canaan's land, which representing that new birth, right? And so it, it has to be a, um, a new man or a new birth, not a new man, but a new birth because Joshua said unless you are born again that you will not you know see the kingdom that we have to be born again from a spiritual standpoint because we understand how I think it was Nicodemus said how can you be born again can you come back into your mother's womb but he didn't understand that he didn't have a, 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 a the Holy Spirit to understand these things but it talks about um you know that that old man has to die and, you know, Dr. Kinley said that he would look in the mirror every day and say, you know, uh, uh, what is that? What do you say? Kill, kill old man or kill old self or something like that. Mm -hmm. So because that old man has to die. But that old man is representing of uh, that physical carnal mind. And when he was talking about that new birth, um, 
it was it was something about um oh that that satanic spirit so we we want to have that new birth because the old physical carnal is representing of that satanic spirit representing of satan because it talks about um i think is is it get genesis um six and four really quick and i just want to point out things that it just stood in my mind when he was talking about that new new man um having to go over and having a new birth versus that old man i've been as tara okay genesis six and four i'm gonna try to hurry up and get these Uh uh-huh there were giants in the earth in those days yeah and also after that when the sons of Elohim came unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the mm-hmm. same became mighty men which were of old, which were of old men of renown. Mm-hmm. Which was old men of renown. So they they renown means like famous. So it's talking about old famous old famous men, right? So keep that in mind. Get Ezekiel 23 and 23. And then get Revelation 12 and 9. Okay. Where are you, Ezekiel? Ezekiel 23 and 23. The, okay. The Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, is that the right spot? I think so, yeah. Hey. Pekod and Shoah and Koa and all the Assyrians with them and all them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. And they shall come again, or sorry, they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons and wheels and with an assembly of people, which shall set against thee, buckler and shield and helmet round about. And I will That's set- familiar. <laughs> it would come again with chariots and wagons. And um, it talks about, again, men of renown, famous men, right? Mm-hmm. So what? who else would be more famous than Satan, than, than that ser- serpent? See, because Joshua Messiah didn't walk around like, you know, um, like, like with that stature. So uh, g- get for me uh, Revelation 12 and 9. And the great talk dragon, about renowned man and famous man. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Right. That old serpent. That's what I, that's what I want to get. That old serpent that Satan was a, a, a a man of renown. He was famous. That's how when Yahshua came and he was casting out those uh, spirits and they recognized him, that was the old spirit way back in, in um, revelations and the eternity when they said, um, when they said, uh, leave us alone let us alone so how did they knew that that was uh you know yashua in the flesh because they were they were men of renown they were men of um old when it talks about the devil the serpent that old devil that old dragon see you will you don't want to have a uh uh we need to have a new birth we need to have that new spirit that righteous spirit put within us we can't have the same thoughts concepts and opinions when we come into class those things have to die off just like those children of israel when they came up out of the land of egypt they couldn't have the same look when they came up out of the land of egypt they had that same um concept of of god or elohim and then they went up there and they built the golden calf so but they they didn't die off those concepts and those um you know thoughts didn't die off you have to die uh, spiritually so in order to to um come up to the messiah you can't carry on that that carnal way of thinking you can't carry on that old self you have to wake up in the mirror like joe always saying kill old self <laughs> so it's like when when you know we look at these things and and that you know chapter of jeremiah 31 31 it's like it's it's new things everything is going to be new and then it talks about in the scriptures um it talks about um having a new earth oh no 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 the tenth aim let me get the tenth aim that's what i wanted and is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of yahshua the messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state in the new earth state see see in the first aim it says to help you find and know Yahweh 
as he really is and actually exists. So that first aim, like you can line them up and I know we don't have time, but you can line the aims up according to the pattern, according to the the um, the children of Israel and that um, migratory track, because the first thing that Yahweh gave them was the name in order for them to come up out of that land of Egypt. But that was the first thing that they had to know was the name and they used that name and it was power in that name to get them up out of that dark land. But the 10th aim, right? It says to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom, which is the, the land, the kingdom of Yahshua Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification. It doesn't say in the old earth state because it's talking about that old earth is going to die. This, this physical earth is, this old earth is going to die off. It's going to be destroyed. It says in the new earth state and it all watch word is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. So in Yahshua, everything is new. It, it, it talks about a new covenant. It talks about a new name that we'll be given a new name you know, um, new earth state, everything is going to be born again, unless you be born again, unless you, you know, get rid of that old self, that old carnal physical mind, you have no hope. But in Yahshua, through the, through the preaching of the gospel, through the law and the prophets, we have hope because this is what, that's what is going to lead you up to the Messiah, to inherit eternal life now. So, um, it, it was so many things that I was just jotting and writing down, but I know I don't have time to go over it. So those are just a couple of things that um, stood out to me. And um, thank you for the time and all praises, honor and glory goes to Yahweh through our son, Yahshua, through his son, Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, that concludes our class for this evening. And we'd like to remind everyone um, and thank everyone for attending tonight's class and remind you that classes are held here every Wednesday from 7 to 9 on Zoom and every Sunday from nine uh, from 11 to 1 on 6615 East Sheldon Road. Can all be dismissed with the doxology taken from the last two verses of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.